high floss too. It's Arlene and it's Monday, February 19th. True confessions time. For those of you who make floss tube videos, I want to know how many of you sit for a few seconds, for a few minutes, for whatever, right before you hit the record, trying to figure out how you're going to start on that day. Whether or not you've got notes and you know like the order of things you're going to talk about, but you're just like, I was just trying to get myself in the right mindset. Like, I'm looking forward to this all day. I'm, I wanted I wanted to do a video this weekend. It's um, President's Day today. I have the day off from school. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And yet I'm sitting here just contemplating. <laughs> anyway, hi. As always, I'm glad to be with all of you. I um, appreciate so much those who come back and those who find me new, um, welcome. I uh, become so aware whenever I don't have, I haven't found too much time to find new people, um, but always appreciate when I have found somebody new that I can feel like I can jump right in without necessarily going back and binge watching everything, although wouldn't that be great with all the time in the world? Um, so for those who are new, welcome. Um, you will discover that I do lots of types of stitching. I'm not just a cross stitcher and I so appreciate those of you who have come along for the ride with me um, in seeing the things that I share. And I also do lace making. I leave that to the end so that the lace that I share doesn't, um, you could choose to say goodbye if you wish. Um, I admit, like I said, I wanted to do a video this weekend and I was like, what am I going to show? Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. And then I started, well, I was like, I could do this and maybe I could bring out this and talk about this and chatter on and well, all right. So I do have a list going here. Now you'll know by the time you're watching this, how long this is, but I was thinking maybe this just won't be a long video and that's okay. Um, I saw at least a couple of pe people in the last bit of time, I guess it's got to be in the last week or so, who have commented that because of the Olympics, it's been watch the Olympics, watch floss tube. Um, I'm someone that has been putting on the Olympics most nights um, just to have that's been my background as I'm stitching in the evenings. Um, and I'll, I'll, well, let me just jump to that right now. Um, I like everything that the spirit of the Olympics is, bringing the world together. Um, I think we can all accept there's a lot of bad in the world. And um, I just appreciate when we can have the moments when we can focus on some of the good. Um, and whether that is seeing the uh, connections between people, um, hearing the stories, we the way you can, nowadays, you can watch live, but you can get online, you can see any story you've missed, you can replay and rewatch and, and everything. And um, I was trying to tell students about, um, you know, it used to be that you could only watch certain parts of the Olympics. And then if you missed it, you missed it. And that just, of course, they can't possibly understand that concept of life before the internet. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of stories that stuck with me from this weekend. I didn't get to watch much last night or the night before. So I, I think I'm talking about Friday night. And I'm also aware that, as always, I know I get backed up in floss tubes. So if you, whenever you get to watching this, I should get, attach some dates to this. So I think it was Friday night. It was the men's long program of um, figure skating. I did not catch the short program, which I think was either the night before or two nights before. I knew the American skater, Nathan Chen, who was a, a metal favorite. Um, he has some amazing technical pieces and he's got the artistry, like he's the full package deal, they say. Um, but apparently he had a disastrous short program, the kind of thing that I don't want to go and watch. You know, you could read the, the blurb, you could read the one paragraph and it's like, I don't need to click on the video. I've learned what I needed to learn. Um, so he went into the long program in like something like 17th place or something like that. Like this guy's not going to get a medal, but what a, what a lesson for all of us to go into his, what he had to do, do his long program 
His long program contained five quads, which, okay, let's face it, people. Jump, spin around four times, and land. <laughs> and do that five times in the course of four minutes. Who amongst us can understand what that really means? Um, and he actually included a sixth one. And his, even the commentators were saying, so I, this I saw a lot, it was live on Friday night. Um, and they, I think they were predicting that he was going to try something like this. Maybe they saw him in practice, I don't know. But then in the quick interview afterwards, I mean, he said, these are the words we all have to keep in our minds. It's like, why not? I had to go for it. I had nothing to lose. And sometimes, and when you fall in life, Sometimes you have to pick yourself up and you absolutely have to go back out there and do whatever it is you need to do. And sometimes it's because you have nothing to lose. You just got to try that much harder. And this was a case where he, he literally fell, he, I guess, multiple times or whatever it was. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the idea, if he was truly in metal contention on um, the long program night, he probably wouldn't have tried for that sixth one. And um, and who knows how things would have been different. And he rocketed up to like fifth place, which mathematically no one had ever like considered the idea that you could go from what I said, I think 17th place to fifth place in a figure skating. Um, but because his, his technical side brought so many points, um, to me, that's just a good story to pass on, um, to, well, I always think about these things in terms of stories to pass on to students, but it's to the adults as well. When you fall in life. Yes, you have to get yourself back up. And in a lot of cases, you have to go back out there and do it again. And sometimes you truly have to do it with the attitude of, I've got nothing to lose. Let me try and do it even better. And he did. And then the other story that I just loved, and this is, so, this is worth like watching. I might even try to put a link if I can find it easily enough. Um, and it was on the same night, like at some point when I was even watching, they, the, um, at some point, not like actually skating, but they were doing like a quick switch or maybe it was at a commercial. They were even saying some exciting um, things happening over at the Super G. We'll bring that to you in a moment. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm not watching that right now. Super G being one of those downhill skiing events that, again, I don't care. So I don't even said this. I'm not a sport person. I'm not an athlete. I never have been. Whenever the Olympics are on, I always learn so much about sports, but about people, about people in the world. Um, so I could have cared less about the Super G event. And if that had been the event that was on television when I turned it on, I would have gone to one of the other Olympic stations to see what else they were showing. So I didn't learn about this till the next morning. And when I clicked on that story, I was like, I have to, this one, I had to watch the video to see it. So this was the event that American Lindsey Vaughn was favored in. And she, she was having an off day. She might've even been sick. She, I think she ended up like in fifth or sixth place, whatever. The, maybe it was like the next favored person was first, was, was like first, first had the, it's a, it's a scored, uh, excuse me, a timed thing. Was doing the best, had the best time. I don't know if there was just one more person to go, but like that person who was in first place had already done her last run, whatever it was. I think they even said NBC had already cut away. Like they thought it was a done deal that the person who was in first place was going to win because this next person, her name is Esther Ledeca, something like that from Czech Republic was getting ready to go. Something like 20 something in the world. Um, she was, she's a snowboarder. Like her main sport is snowboarding. She was totally crossing over to another sport instead of one, you know, platform. It was two platforms, two skis. She skis down this hill and is in first place. She has the fastest time. And what was so wonderful about this or what, what's really sort of heartwarming is if you see the video is her reaction because you know, you, you do something like this in a, a timed event where you're looking at a screen, you're not waiting for judges scoring in some subjective way. This is a very objective, who does it the fastest? So you, you see the video of her looking at, you know, what you assume is like the, the timing score. And in most cases, you have these athletes that are on their knees or they're pumping their fists or whatever. She's just staring. She's like, and she's like looking around like, did I just do that? And you hear all these people yelling and screaming in all kinds of languages. And she, 
you could tell it just had not processed at all. And, um, you know, sometimes we all need those surprises in life. And that's another piece to take with us. Sometimes you never know what you can do until you give it a try. And if that means a snowboarder doing downhill skiing and winning a gold medal in the process, you never know. Okay, now I've just been talking for 10 minutes and haven't gotten to anything. Let me start. <laughs> ah. Okay. Um, let me get going here, people. One of the reasons that I was worried about um, what do I do for this floss tube was because the stitching that I've been doing lately is, and so in my last floss tube video, um, if you remember, or if you didn't watch it, which I know happens, uh, or if you're new, um, I shared the exciting news that I had a design accepted to the Just Cross Stitch uh, magazine. Um, it will be published in the September, October issue, and I'm stitching the model for it. And I'm um, like madly stitching because I just want to get it done and I can't share it with you. And it's the only thing I've been stitching on and trying to use all my stitching time and, and taking away from other things just to get it done. Um, I haven't been able to post stitching on Instagram. You know, it's it's sort of like, what, what am I going to show on a video <laughs> if I'm not going to show the stitching? Um, you know, I suppose it's like sometimes when you're stitching for a gift or with a deadline, and it's not that you don't like what you're stitching. Sometimes you get a little tired of it. Um, you just want to be doing something else, but you have to do it. It's kind of where I am right now. Um, I can show you this uh, the, from my last video, which was a few weeks ago. Um, I did work a little bit longer before I started working on the model stitching on this piece. I, I looked at that video and I thought, well, this looks a little different, so I'll show it. Just So this was about maybe a week's more worth of time working on my mosaic quilt. I'm trying to see it. My mosaic quilt piece. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to tilt it too. Um, for those who've stuck with me here, or have, excuse me, have been with me, I am taking a quilt that I saw in a museum and turning it into a cross-stitch pattern. I've basically figured out what I'm at least going to be trying to put into those empty spaces. Um, I just, like I said, I had to force myself to stop working on this. Um, so this is this is what the quilt looks like. This is my version. Yes, I'm stitching it on point. It was the way to get the right look. And I've tried to I've tried to explain that in other videos. The explanation doesn't go super well. But um, it's a little bit further along from the last time. But like I said, it was only a week or so. And then I switched over to my model stitching. Um, and so I've been working on designs. Um, so again, those who are new, welcome. Um, I have been... Uh, designing my own patterns and selling on my Etsy store, which is called Works by ABC. And the video would not be complete if I didn't show you my wonderful mug. Works by ABC is my Etsy store. If you go to Etsy, um, don't put in the spaces, Works by ABC. Um, and you can find my store. And I realize because I have to do, have to, I do, I have to do this model stitching, It's it's holding up when I can put out my next set of designs because I want to finish the mosaic quilt because if I'm that close I might as well get it finished and have a finished picture to go with the pattern and I also need to make sure that the last pieces that I think I'm going to do are going to work um and then the other thing I want to stitch I have it mostly graphed out but there's always a chance that I need to change it as I go and I need to take pictures as I go is um so I have done three of these that I call my canvas work squares and they are intended to be they are beginner canvas work pieces if you've never stitched on canvas before if you've never stitched canvas work stitches um, I tried to write out instructions that are very user-friendly very much assuming little to no experience with this um, with this kind of stitching um, for people to try out and um, I I have a plan of the fourth one um, but I need to stitch it um, and then I also have some other designs but it's those two that need to be stitched the the fourth canvas work square and the finished mosaic quilt that I need to work on but I'm working on this model 
It's just the way things are, people. Anyone want to guess what colors? I mean, it, these designs have been done with um, two, like a dark and a light of one color and an accent color. I've used the same accent color on all three, which is 840 or 41 DMC. Um, again, just trying to show you that canvas work can be done with basic threads. It doesn't have, I mean, I love the canvas work that has all kinds of cool threads, but it doesn't have to be done that way. Um, but if anyone wants to guess what color threads I've picked out for um, my next one, go ahead, leave it in the comments. Um, so yeah, there's some stitching that needs to get done before I can put out my next set of designs, which will also include some ones that I don't have stitch models for, but I'm excited for what they are. Um, I just got to share because this has been shared in other ways with other people. This past weekend, I was at my LNS for <laughs> thread emergency as I needed to go get more thread for the model stitching I'm doing. And I discovered that they have the new DMC colors that they're selling there. Um, and when I, I posted this on Instagram and some people responded that they also have seen them at their LNSs, they are not in, you know, the Michaels and the Joann's, the big box stores yet. I'm assuming at some point down the line, DMC will do that. But, you know, I, I kind of like that they're giving the LNSs the first, the first wave. Um, I wasn't feeling the need to buy the whole set. I just wanted to get the ones that, as some people have shown the, um, like the collector tins, I could see from that, those showings, there would be, it's like the last numbers. It's literally 26 through, I think it is all, but 26 through 35 that are the, the appealing to me. So this color mm -hmm. this color family, and then there's this color family. And then actually this guy is part of a different color family, but to my eye, he seemed to be part of that color family. Um, and I don't have a clear plan of what I will stitch with them. I sort of don't want to specifically put them into any design until they are easily found. Um, I, that's just where I am as a designer. I am, I'm in the beginning stages of what I'm doing. And so I want to appeal to those who are, um, have easy or for the materials that you could do easy access. Now, a lot of the things that I do, I think you could go with wonderful, like over dyed and variegated all kinds of everything. But, um, I, and you could certainly use any of these colors. Um, now I'm rambling. I just wanted to get some that certainly appealed to me, but we could talk about DMC cause this is the next thing on my list. So I posted on, Instagram about a week ago this picture um, and I um, and the, the caption I wrote said when your DMC thread organization is a system that doesn't work very well and a color card only goes so far sometimes you just got to sit on the floor of Michaels to figure out some things to figure some things out when you're working on a new pattern design. And that's what I was doing. I was on the, I was sitting on the floor of Michael's and I mean, you could see I had my color card with me, but you know, at that moment in time, I had pulled a bunch of yellows and I pulled a bunch of greens and I was, you know, that was the way to compare them next to each other in a way that a color card, you couldn't do it with. Now, I, as I wrote in here, I have, I'm not going to claim I have all of them. I have probably close to 400, 380 or so of the DMC colors. Um, and it is true that how I have them organized is not a useful system. A lot of the times it's certainly not useful for what I was trying to do, which is, okay, I could see all the yellows on my color card system which is, which goes next to what, what, okay. For one of these patterns that I'm creating that I'm now, of course I was sitting there and doing them like, Oh my God, I want to stitch this one right now. Um, and to take out, like I probably had most, if not all of those threads, but to take them out of the various like baggies that I have them in, in the odd way that they're put, and then to get them back in those baggies in the odd way that they're put, it was just going to be more effort than it was worth. Whereas, 
to go to the, the shopping center where the Michaels is or the Joann's is at some point, actually, and the honest thing is this was, this was my second session of what I was doing. I had done an earlier session, probably about a week earlier in the Joann's and then, and only got so far and got tired of it and went back a second time to the Michaels because, you know, after I was done with what I was doing, I would carefully put them back in the number slots where they belong. Um, so the reason I'm sharing this all with you, because if you talk, if you, um, listen to the podcast, we talk fi or fiber talk, um, which you should the, <laughs> this past week, the midweek show, Gary and Christine, we're talking about my picture and Gary thought it was the funniest thing that I was sitting on the floor of Michael's with the DMC threats. Christine, on the other hand, thought it was a perfectly normal thing to do. And, um, and some of the comments, the, the co there, there were a few comments and, and there were people who more or less said, I could see you doing this. Um, I've done that too. A girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. I'm curious to know, and Gary, I hope you're watching. Um, how many of you have done something like this? Now it could be, you just have like all the threads and you have them in such a way that pulling them out and laying them out, like maybe you don't need to do something like this. And it could be that if you're trying to match up or you're looking for like the perfect red or the perfect yellow, and it could be, you've never had a need to do something like this, but I don't have a problem when it comes to like a Michael's or a Joann's of sitting on the floor and getting down and dirty with it in terms of <laughs> laying out the floss and figuring out what works with what I need to do. And, um, I just have to believe there's other people out there that have done this. So please let me know if you've done it. Um, I also have, and, and here's another thing I'm curious to know. For those who've been stitching for a long time, do you have any concern about your DMC floss not being true to color anymore? Whether that's an issue of it fading over time or, I mean, I know DMC seems to be very proud that their, their colors are, are their colors. So I guess it's more of an issue of like just time passing, not so much that the, but, you know, 340 would look different than 340 of 20 years ago or something. But so my not very good organized system, it, when I first started stitching, and this was in high school and into college, I was a bobbinator. I bobbin, bob, bobbinated, okay? So I have a container over there. Oh, look, you can see it. It's right there, okay? That container has my oldest DMC threads in it. And um, then... It's been about, I mean, the threads that are in there are about 20 years, at least 20 years old. Okay. And then I, I can, I can tell you for sure. No, I can't tell you for sure. At some point I discovered floss wear bags and I thought, why in the world would anyone bobbinate, which I never even used that word until floss too. Why would anyone wrap, take the time to wrap threads when you could just throw it in a bag? So the containers, you can see one of them here, and then there's two others that's out of screenshot there, are filled with floss away bags that are in rings that have a ribbon tied to them. And so, and those rings, most of them originated with projects that were cross-stitch projects that had lots of colors in them. And then there was a certain point that I surveyed everything that I owned, and with a good sale at Michael's or wherever, this was years ago, I filled in the hundred and whatever that I needed. So there's one big ring that has a whole bunch of them and it's all like color coded with ribbons. And then I have a chart where I keep track. So if I need to know where is color 1072, I look at my chart and color 1072 is either in the box or in one of those containers. And I've got a little color system. Oh, it's in the ring that's tied with the purple ribbon or it's the ring tied with the blue ribbon. That's my crazy system. People. I know it's not the way I should do it. Um, Last summer, I should show you this. Not last summer, sorry. Um, I've sh I showed this. I showed this in a video last summer. This was a lace project that I did um, for a contest called. And the theme of the contest was 200. And this piece has 200 different color threads in it. This accrue color is is not counting, but all the rest are 200. And I used DMC thread. I didn't use a thread that's specifically made for 
lace. Um, and it was when I was doing this project, so I was specifically looking for some specific DMC colors that I was very aware of how stupid <laughs> my system was. And I know at the time I said, when I'm done with this lace project, I am totally going to reinvent or redo my DMC system. I never did. And that's partially because I don't have that much need for it. On occasion, I'll go and get a specific color. And for a specific color, my system works. I look at my chart. Oh, it's the blue ribbon bundle. I go find the blue ribbon bubble. I find it. Okay. Um, and if it's a new project that I'm starting, I will usually buy new threads. Um, I don't stitch a lot of smalls. I don't stitch a lot of, um, well, anyway, the system basically works for me, except for like when I'm designing something and the color card, you know, is really trying to match up. You'll see. I'm excited for when I get to show it to you, and I will explain it all then. You will totally understand then the design I was working on sitting on the floor of Joann's and Michael's. You will totally understand why the color card was not enough and why I really needed the floss in hand and taking in and out of my little baggies and then, again, wondering whether threads that were 20 years old, are they still the same color that they would be going to the store? Okay. That's an awful lot. Okay, so now back to back to Gary, Christine, and Fiber Talk. Um, they are great podcasts. I learn so much. And I just like again and again just want to recommend you listen to them. If you especially if you listen if you watch Floss Tube and you tend to like me more listen and you know and occasionally look over because you're stitching or something, a podcast is is even that much better because you're you would totally be focusing on your um, stitching. Um, something came, I was, uh, on a drive yesterday and I was listening and now this might've been, I'm also listening to them out of order. So now I think this was another weekly show, a midweek chat, and it might've been like two or three weeks old and something that, um, they were talking about organizing their threads. And Christine was saying about, she was like ruminating over it. Would you organize your threads by, by number or by color? Interesting question. Like in my perfect world, I'd have two sets of DMC. I'd have two sets. I'd have one that'd be by number, and then I'd have one that would be by this. So that when I'm using this and I'm like, oh, I wanna go just one shade darker or one shade lighter, it'd be right next to the one I'm looking at. So I wouldn't have to do like odd pullings. But when I'm working with something or a pattern that already has numbers, I can just pull by number. Like that'd be the ideal world, two sets. Yeah, there's a lot of things in the ideal world that, that ain't happening, people. Okay? All right. Um, oh, and they just posted yesterday. I haven't listened to, to it yet, but just uh, for the cross-stitch people, particularly, would be very interested, the designer of Rosewood Manor. They did an interview with her. Um, I love a lot of the Rosewood Manor designs. I can't say I've ever stitched any of them. I know I probably only have a couple charts, but I know when people share pictures, I, I think there's so many beautiful ones. So I'm looking forward to when I get a chance to listen to that interview, um, to hear the inspiration and, and where the ideas come from for, for all designers. Um, but there's, I, again, can't say enough about um, what I learn and what I pick up. So on that car drive, I was listening to Another one of their shows is with uh, was with um, the designer Terry Bay, who I I knew about from Nordic Needle. Um, she does a number of things, including hard anger and Ukrainian white work, and some other things. Um, but they were talking about white work, and one of the things that Gary was saying, and it's something I've you know can remember going through this myself, sometime way way back, thinking. White on white, huh, huh? But then doing some white on white, that my favorite white on white, which also had lots of gold in it, is a piece that I gave dear, dear, dear friend. Um, and I keep thinking one day I need, to, I need to visit and do like a video from her home to show you all the things I've given her over the years. Totally different story. White on white. I've done white on white. I've shown you a hard anger. I've shown you um, Yvette Stanton the one with all the bullions. Portuguese white work. Um, so I haven't done any of the Terry Bays, but it got me thinking. So blah. 
I've been thinking about what have and have I not shown on floss tubes? And um, because I've lost track, I had, I have this paper where I pretty early on wrote down here are all the things that I can think of that I could show on a floss tube. Um, and the trouble is months ago, I forgot to stop. I, I stopped checking off. I, had, I was very good in the beginning checking off what have I shown. Um, and short of binge watching my own, <laughs> I don't remember some of the things. Like, did, did I show this one or not? This I'm pretty sure I haven't shown. So a few years ago, this is, this is, <laughs> This is all in the spirit of white work. Um, a few years ago, when I was at, um, uh, uh, for a number of years, I've gone no longer, but I w went to Vermont during the summer for a week long lace, bobbin lace um, class. And there's off, a lot of the same people come every year. There's a lot of sharing of all kinds of things. I think this came from my lace teacher. I think she got it from, she got a bunch of things that were given to her by somebody else and she brought them that week and said, anyone want any of this? And it was a lot of linens and we were trying to date them. Um, and she said, if anyone wants any of this, you can have it. So from the time period where a person would purchase a linen like this that was stamped, I got a white finger, there we go, that was stamped, and you would um, stitch, so it was stitched cut work. Now this one says, and it says pure linen, and it's a very, it's a very tightly woven fabric. It's not like linen you would stitch on for um, cross stitch. It's like more of a, a embroidery kind of linen. Um, it doesn't have easily accessible holes, and it's it's got like quite a sheen to it. Um, this one says it's a three-piece buffet set because I remember the whole conversation we had at the time were some of the some of the linens she had were those old sets that you would put on a chair there would be a piece that would go like right behind where your head was and then a piece on either of the arms and it was something like from the time like turn of the century or whatever where men would wear have a lot of hair grease and then something also about like it was like protecting your chair from hair grease and from like something else that was common on your arms. So this set looks like that because there's a piece here and then there's a piece here. And then this. So this was the first one that I did. So this is cut work. That um, is basically I just did with like a buttonhole, like a padded buttonhole stitch and a, um, a stem stitch of some kind. And so I, I did this one and I, I liked it. It was just like, a, it was a, where I know where these came, these were in my life for a few weeks. It was, it was a good carry, carry with me project. Um, and I know I did this one. This was sort of like my practice one because the other, so I took this linen from her pile and then I took this linen from her pile because this one I thought would, um, and it says embroider with peri luster also. And this was like a name of a thread. And this one has a tag on it, which I don't know, maybe there's someone who recognizes the name of the store. Um, Barnard, Nammer and Putnam Company in Worcester, Massachusetts. It cost $1.79. This is like, a, this is a table runner. And I thought, and so you can see where I got with it, including the cut work part of it. And I, again, it was a great carry, carry with me project for a few weeks, for a period of time that it was just, I just loved it. I, I tired of it. I mean, you could see I only got like this corner done. And then there was another issue with it. And if anyone has any ideas, I don't know when or if I will ever pick, the, pick this back up in my life. But I'm curious if anyone has any ideas. The blue printing on here. Now, I have no idea what the date is. Is this from the 50s? Is this from the 30s? Is this earlier than that? There were no dates. There's um, the writing at the bottom indicates that it's Paragon Needlecraft. Um, and this, it, uh, this is a scarf, whatever, um, pure linen, also made in this design, 
unlike, you know, there's this design, this design is also made in these various other sizes, um, including a chair back set and a bridge set. Um, so I, I'm picturing some, like, some sort of catalog. You could order all the different sizes if you wanted to get matching parts, linens in your home. Again, I pictured it as like a table runner. I don't, I can't, I don't know how to show it. I mean, the ends were just, it was just a pretty design, but the blue in an, I, I think in an ideal world, your stitching is so perfect that you completely and utterly cover up the blue. Is this blue stuff, again, this is old, this is not modern. Is this meant to be washed out in some way? I've never tried to wash it. I have a hard time believing that this blue is like the kind of blue and the inks that we have nowadays that can be washed out. What, what was the intention back in, and again, I don't even have the decade. I mean, I'm assuming 20th century, but I don't even have the decade. Now, as I stitched, you know, I was able to do a pretty good job at covering the blue, but there's some areas where I was using um, Pearl 8. I'm pretty sure I was using a Pearl 8. Yeah, it looks like a Pearl 8. But there's some areas like this motif here. I mean, you could definitely see the blue showing through. Was I just supposed to do a better job and, and just be covering up the blue altogether? Is there some way to make the blue go away? What was the intention? Do we have any fabric textile people, like textile historians watching that would know anything about this kind of textile, whatever its time period is? I mean, I don't know, with, with a price of $1.79, does that help at all? How, you know, when would something like this have cost $1.79? When was the store Barnard, Summer, and Putnam Company in Worcester, Massachusetts around? Like, there's no clue. I've tried. I remember at the time trying, and I remember not succeeding and getting very far. Um, but it was something I was thinking about when it came to white work. It's like I said, it's, it's, it's like cut work embroidery. So it was doing mostly buttonhole stitches with a few other stitches and then cutting out these areas where you see here. And, and like, so here's a, an unstitched or only partially stitched part. Everywhere you see this little X is an area that's supposed to be cut out. So, um, and sure, every time I take out something like this to share on a floss tube, there's always this little side of me that's like, oh, maybe I need to come back to it. And, you know, something, again, this was with, with a ball of pearl eight and a needle and a folding scissors was a good pro. You don't need a pattern to follow. You know, you're just sitting there. Sti I think I just stitched in hand. I don't think, I don't think there was even a hoop involved in what I was doing. Um, but I have to keep this in mind next time I might need a little travel project, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. The next thing on my notes to talk about. Allie Stitching Studio. Allie, if you haven't seen her floss tube, she's Australia. Um, if she's, she's Australian. She's Australian. Um, she commented, was it on my last video? I think it was on my last video when I was sharing about my um, mosaic and showing the piece and talking about um, the quilt from the museum that she finally recognized it, that it, 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 the, the quilt was part of a collection of an Australian art historian. She had seen the um, article about that quilt collection in a magazine. I had to go and watch her video that she shared about that. Um, I will link that below. Um, and in that process, she, in that same video, she was talking about a design of mine that she was stitching. And I just needed to share, because what she talked about is just so wonderful. For those who um, love a pattern that tells you exactly what to do, pick, use this color, this color, and this color on this fabric, and those people who say, yes, thank you, telling, thank you for telling me what to do, that's all great. But I think we all have a creative side in, uh, in us. We, we wouldn't be doing what we do if we didn't have that creative side. Um, and if you are looking for new ways to explore um, putting your own touch to a project, I love what Allie did. She had um, a piece of fabric that she loved. And she realized that the fabric had it's either four or five colors in it. And she realized one of my designs had that same number of needed colors, four or five. 
And so she matched DMC colors with the fabric and she's using those colors for the, the design of mine. Loved it. And so it just reminds me, it, it made me want to talk about this to this idea of use something else to be inspired by what appeals to you. Um, and that's a weird sentence. So let me be more clear. So you may have heard this tip before, but I will share it because I have used it for a long time. But I remember when I first learned it, it was like mind blowing to me. Um, when you are, if you are trying to come up with your own um, color scheme for something and you just like can't even think where to start, I, I want to like, I want to do this geometric pattern in my own colors, but I don't even know what colors would look good. So here's an idea. If you have the, well, I suppose you could find decent enough pictures online in some cases, but especially if you have the ability to see them in person. If you can go to a, a needlework store and find um, over dyed threads, and this is not showing up. Let me try. Hmm. Um, find over dyed threads and find a color scheme that just appeals to you. Whatever it is, I'm looking for good white paper, and of course, I don't have any good white paper sitting around here. Oh, that's a little over that. If you can find a color scheme that just appeals to you, you don't even have to buy the thread, okay? But you find, you're like, wow, I like that variegated thread. You don't even have to stitch with it. But then you ask your, that is colors that appeal to you. And then it becomes your color palette. For a project. So this particular, this is a water lilies, this is a Karen collection thread, it's the cell, it's their silk. Um, but from here, there are pinks and purples and like a blue violet with a brown. And I know you're not seeing that very well, and I give up trying to find the best way. For, you're just gonna have to believe me on that, okay? I actually have another version that is undone. So um, and sometimes with these beautiful the way they're beautifully wound, when you undo them, <laughs> They don't look as beautiful, but um, this is my example of what may have been the first time I ever used this principle because I was, so this is, I can date it, it was 10 years ago, um, because I was making a gift for a friend um, and I'm going to say it was, it was a baby gift, but this was a friend who I knew would not want a, a typical baby sampler and she, you know, we, I talked to her about it. I said, it's very important to me to make a gift honoring this new baby of yours. Um, am I right that sort of the traditional baby sampler with name, date, weight, and all that is not going to be the best thing to have hanging on your wall? She's like, yes, thank you. <laughs> and sort of what we agreed upon is she wanted a piece of, of needlework art. And she said, do whatever you want. And whatever message you can write on the back will hang in my daughter's room for as, I think she said something like, for as long as I can make it stay in the room or something silly like that. But, um, and that little baby is 10 years old right now. That's how I can date this project. So um, what I, the challenge I wanted for myself at the time, if you um, have ever heard the name Tony Maneri, um, he is very well known in the painted canvas world. He also has done, um, he's just well known in that world. This is a pattern of his called Stars for the Millennium. Um, and, um, I do not have any interest in getting rid of this because I have used pieces of his, his, uh, designs for other things because I really like, um, the, the composite, compositeness, we'll say. Um, but I loved the challenge of this and this was the essence of what I wanted to do. And what I decided is like, I needed to do my own color scheme because this was his original color scheme, and then there's like listings for a whole bunch of other. Um, I don't remember if he had like a pilot class where he had a bunch of other co people's color schemes. It has a ton of different kinds of threads. Um, so I don't have this piece, obviously. It's hanging in my friend's home. <laughs> what I have, one thing she had sent me, I, th I think she left. It's like a magnet, it hangs on my refrigerator. So it was like a Shutterfly or what are one of those um, freebies that she'd gotten. So this is what I made. And you may or may not be able to tell, but the color scheme was inspired by th this thread. 
I didn't use, I think I thought I was going to use this thread in there because in his original design, he do, it does start with using an overdyed thread and I believe the overdyed thread does get used in his design. And I don't think I originally planned it, but as I started to plot out what I was gonna do, I decided, you know what? I don't wanna use the overdyed thread. I want the colors of the overdyed thread. And that's what I ended up using. And what I what I also I some of the stars are in a different order. Um, I alternated highlighting blue and pink, which sort of shows. Like you can see. I can't do this right. Yeah, here we go. Um, blue, uh, blue, blue, blue. Like. Can you tell how <laughs> it alternates the highlighting of blue and pink? I mean, she knew she was having a daughter, but she was also not the kind of person that was going to put too much pink all over in her world. Um, I just, I loved what I did in terms of um, taking a pattern, but really making it my own. Um, but so this was my example. And I just, I share this with you. It's the same idea of what Allie did in having a piece of fabric, but you take a thread. That, and so I just pulled out a few over dyes that I don't, do this very often. I think some of you would be gravely disappointed if you looked at my stash. Um, I have a pitiful, like if you saw the fabric I had, you guys would be really disappointed in me. I have a little bit more in terms of threads, but I, I don't, I don't just purchase just to have. I just, I just never have. But there's been a few cases, mostly having to do with a store closing, that I have purchased some threads. But like here are examples of various over dyed threads that I have because of the color palettes. And I don't know if I will ever stitch with these threads. And again, you so can't tell the colors. That's a little better. Oh, and here's here's another one. Like this is um, one of the Rainbow Gallery ones. Um, like that are just potentially inspirational to me for color palettes. So that's, I just wanted to share that tip with you because I loved what Allie, because it works for fabric as well. Find a fabric that you love. And hey, use that fabric in the finishing of your stitching, just like what Allie's doing. So um, yeah, there you go. Okay, um, what's next on my list? Um, oh, here's, a, I was just gonna share this little piece. Um, many places in various ways are starting to talk about the Nashville needle work market that's coming up. Um, it, I wouldn't call this my local needlework store by any means, but the Strawberry Sampler, which is in Pennsylvania, although I always think of them as Delaware because the only times I've ever been there is when I've gone to uh, Winterthur, which is in Delaware. But I, I've stopped at the Strawberry Sampler a few times. They put out a great newsletter. It's just hysterically funny. Um, last year, they had an amazing series of newsletters related to Nashville, related to before Nashville in terms of previews of things. Um, I'm just putting in a little plug that if you are somebody who's really interested in what's coming out new and all of that, they are a great store to get on their newsletter list, um, email to you. And um, you can see they already started working in the part of their website where they like they will list, they show everything by floor, like in the hotel where the Nashville needlework market takes place, like who's on the second floor and who's on the third floor and who's on the fourth floor. Um, if they do it the same way they did it last year, um, if you're someone who's interested in all of that, you might want to sign up for the Strawberry Sampler newsletter. I'll hopefully remember to put a link below. Um, that's just like a little PSA because, you know, if you're in another part of the country or another part of the world, you might not necessarily know about this store, which I don't know how big they are, how well known they are, but um, they, at least last year, did a really good job in sharing about market. Um, so I'm just doing a plug for them. Okay, I think I'm gonna move into the lace section of today's floss tube video. Um, I had this all set up to talk about one other time and then that other time the video was already going too long so I cut it, but I'm gonna get it in this time. A few videos ago, I was talking about needle lace. Uh, I shared a little bit about the difference between needle lace and bobbin lace. And as I was sharing a needle lace project, I even had paused sort of saying, oh wait, this isn't exactly the first time. And I'm like, oh, I gotta share that another time. So here I am kind of backtracking. What I'm gonna share with you today has 
two different ways to pronounce it, Carrickmacross or Carrickmacross. And you can even say, see by this subtitle, Irish Embroidered Net Lace. So it doesn't even really get to be in the same category as needle lace because it's not really lace that's created just with needle and thread. Um, but when you look at some of the pictures that you would actually even like this cover, I mean, especially from a distance, you just, wow, isn't that beautiful lace? And if you're not thinking or not knowing about how it's structured and how it's put together, you wouldn't necessarily, um, I don't know, it, it, it's all about how, here you are having your little lace lesson for today. So this is almost like another category of lace, although I don't know any other types of lace that fall under the same category because it's definitely not bobbin lace and it's not even needle lace, but you use a needle to create it. It's, um, so I'm going to read, so the time, what I was thinking of in that time that I paused in that last video is when I took a class in it. And I'm going to read this little blurb that was from my classwork at that time. Curric Macross lace is a form of needle made, a form of needle made lace. It takes its name from the town of Curric Macross in County Monaghan in Ireland. It was an inspired lace originally developed as a copy of Italian made needle laces in the early 1800s. In the mid 1800s, it was developed into a cottage industry during the great famine of, the eight, of 1845 to 1847. It was in demand and flourished until the late 1800s. Carrick Macross was kept alive during, due to the intervention of an order of nuns for about a hundred years. It was often the nuns that saved certain types of laces. In 1990, the sisters handed on their lace industry to a lace cooperative that continues the lace making tradition in the town it's named for today. Do we have any um, Irish floss tubers? I would love to know. Have you seen, have you, has anyone ever been to Ireland, have been to Carrick Macross, Carrick Macross? Um, so this book that I have, which I purchased at the time that I um, was taking the class, you can see, and you can also, if you were to, you know, eBay it, the words, you can see these pictures of the idea that it was something that was created that was inspired by, quote, the real laces, and certainly has much, much beauty to it. Now, what I did in that class was this piece, and I have this prepared, and it's made of layers. There's a net. This is a machine-made net and a very um, fine, like, gauzy material. And I forget whether it's a linen or a cotton kind of gauzy material. I got light issues today here, guys. Um, and you use a thick, it's not a pearl, but it's a, a thick thread and obviously like a fine sewing thread and you sew things together and you cut out parts like originally there were layers um but then you cut out parts so that only the oh, sorry <laughs> you cut out parts so that only the net is showing in certain places and obviously you can also cut completely as this part was so this was the class piece that i did and then from this book that I just showed you, I did my second piece. Um, and I mean, in a lot of ways, it was like, it's like fine hand sewing. It's something to do in hand and it involved a lot of hand sewing. That's the best way I would say it. And it's, I think it, it's a very beautiful, there we go. Um, I never did anything more with it. Um, it's the kind of thing you could take a beautiful um, or a simple like coloring book design just with the outlines and get the basic idea of it. There were cer there's certain things that are very traditional like these little loops at the end and to have these little um, circular things here. But so this is Carrick Macross or Carrick Macross, and I was like trying to figure out what I don't remember, which is the right way. So I also wanted to show for those lace people who have found me or those who have become interested in lace because of me, this is a really great book if you have gotten intrigued by the different kinds of laces that I've talked about. This Guide to Lace and Linens, um, which I almost wish it, it didn't have that part of the title. 
because this is very much, I mean, it, it goes through literally the different types of laces. There's hammer tan, there's hard, a hard anger, okay, there's um, girl's point, there's, and Cantu, I showed you a piece of Cantu, and here's the page, and here's where I felt okay in that it actually has, how to pronounce it, is both Carrick Macross or Carrick Macross. And it categorizes it as cut work and cut work applique, as opposed to, you know, like Cantu is a bobbin lace and um, Shanty is a bobbin lace and um, others would be a needle lace. You know, this, this is a book that helps you figure out, in theory, you find an old piece of handmade lace at an antique store and you want to know what kind of lace it is. If you know the right things to look for, a book like this could potentially help you. Oh, it's Bruges. Oh, it's blonde. Oh, it's blanche. It, you know, again, so many of these kinds of things I've learned just from doing lace for so many years and seeing different people doing different styles and learning from that way. But this book by Elizabeth Corella is, um, I've used this as a guide so many times. Um, and just because I'll just give you another little tidbit. Um, I borrowed a book from one of the members of my lace group and <laughs> the next type of lace I want to try called Milanese, like as in Milan, as in Italy. So it's inspired, you know, from Italy. If you were to look in Elizabeth Carella's book, Milanese lace of old is very relatively speaking, very different than this kind, this stuff. There are so many patterns in here that I just, you know, whether it's a, an abstract looking design or a, something that is intended to be a little bit more pictorial that I just would love, gosh, you're not seeing anything. Um, Flower Springs. There are so many of these that I was like, oh, I want to try this out. Have I done any Milanese? No. Do I need to understand how to like work the stitches and the braids and stuff? Yes. Do I need more time in my life to do this? Yes. Um, but there are so many things in here that I think are so beautiful. And I did just recently purchase, uh, this is why this has become my new, uh, obsession is too strong, but my new lace thinking. I did, look at this dragon. I did just recently purchase a Milanese book that's a little bit more of like a um, instruction book. So between that book that I own and this book that I borrowed, oh, look at this. Oh my God, I just want to do so many of these. This book, you it's out of print. You can find copies that are being sold for about $100. <sighs> you know where to go with that. Anyway, um, you know, people often have asked, okay, what do you do with your bobbin lace? And while I have a few pieces hanging on the wall, um, and I've given some bookmarks and little things like that, for me, lace, it's just about the process. Look at this, Hydra. How many heads does that thing have? It's about what you're, what I'm doing, what I'm making, the beauty of it, the figuring out the challenge of it. Um, Oh man, can we just create some more hours in the day so that we have time to do all the things we want to do? All right, I'm going to wrap this up for today. I actually went a lot longer than I thought I was going to. As always, thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, I appreciate all of you out there. I've said it before, I will say it again. You are all my people and you mean a lot to me. Um, I... Uh, Hope that you are all going to hang in there like I am and making it through our days. Um, I appreciate comments and likes and connections and all the ways that I've had connections. Um, until next time. <laughs>